Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host Jeff Williams. We're another, here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload coming up just for you. Uh, with tax day coming around, April 15th is just around the corner. There is a question. Why are American, f Americans working fewer hours? You know, with our Prager University segment of this week, we actually have the answer. And we're going to go right to Prager because we do, when I say jam-packed, we do have a jam-packed epi uh, episode. But uh, for what we're going to be talking about the re uh, for the rest of the show, our Prager University doesn't exactly fit. But let's make sure with tax day we take a close look at this. So let's go right on over to Prager U. This is Kelly. She's a hardworking, independent college student. To pay for school, she works between 35 and 39 hours a week at her local grocery store. But today's been rough for <gasps> Kelly. She's just been told that she's now part of a new group of Americans, the 29ers. Let me explain. Starting in 2015, the Affordable Care Act requires many companies to offer health insurance to employees who work 30 hours or more a week. As you may have guessed, the grocery store Kelly works for is one of these companies. The owners of her grocery store and companies like it would love to supply health insurance for all of their employees. Unfortunately, this isn't an expense that many companies can afford and still stay in business without big price increases to consumers. So now Kelly and hundreds of thousands of part-time employees' hours are now capped at 29 hours per week, which means Kelly will have to find another part-time job to make up for the lost hours. The law is flawed, resulting in people having less money and still no health insurance. Sometimes government policies sound good, but have unintended consequences. To subscribe. And so what we're seeing now, this is the last year where we actually have the individual mandate because of 2017 uh, tax law. And even though the, it appears that the, the individual mandate won't be enforced, the fact is Congress is still yet to really repeal the Affordable Care Act. The individual mandate went away with that last tax bill in December. We've discussed that in the past. But the thing is, it, the health insurance is still a big part of the problem. You know, I'm hearing more and more about how the unemployment rate is at, at its low, how more companies are still hiring, and yes, that may be true, but are they really hiring full-time, good-paying positions with benefits? The answer to that is still no. And the big reason behind that is the Affordable Care Act. This is something that Congress still needs to address because businesses are still feeling the pinch even though there is an expansion in the economy going on right now. But as I said, we're not going to be beating that horse dead. We've covered this in the past and we are actually going into something that actually deals a little bit with horses. Um, today is the 5th of April. Tomorrow is the 156th anniversary of the Battle of Shiloh. We have never really covered the Battle of Shiloh in any great depth. Uh, and as, as you know, if you've been watching the show for any great length of time, we do throw in historical programs on occasion. You know, we don't do it all the time. It's not just merely a historical program. Uh, but we also hope that whenever we do cover something that by the time we're finished, you say, oh, that at least makes sense. I'm not going to give you a Ph.D. level dissertation about the Battle of Shiloh any more than I have the Nashville campaign, Gettysburg, anything in World War II. Uh, but at the same time, with uh, the Battle of Shiloh being as important as it was, I think we might want to take a moment to just revisit that. And that's kind of what we're going to do today. Uh, if you have been watching this show for any great length of time, we have covered... Uh, the mining issues up in northern Minnesota extensively before they became a big deal for the mainstream media and most viewers. We were already on top of that with the Esser Steel Minnesota uh, failings up at Nashawak. Uh, we were covering the iron ore industry and how it was being pressured and how uh, steel dumping occurred. We were doing that before the tariffs under President Obama and subsequently under President Trump were, un, uh, were actually even formulated, we, and we were covering that. We covered the 2016 presidential campaign quite intently, and we were ahead of the curve on a lot of different issues. And we explained to you last week about how the December tax cut bill actually impacts small businesses and uh, mid-sized businesses. We heard that from members of Congress. So we cover things 
before a lot of other people do. And we also, at the end of the day, you get a chance to say that makes sense. And this, I hope, is going to be another one of those episodes. So now, why Shiloh? Now, we're going to take a quick look back. I'm not going to show any video at the moment, but hear me out. If you look at the way our country was set up by 1862, go back to the colonial era. When it comes to wars, we never really had a big war that impacted the lives of just about everybody. Now, I say that, of course, it, you know, we did have wars you know, per capita. Uh, we had the Pequot War in 1637. That was really the first war on American soil. We had King Philip's War in 1675, 1676. Per capita, that was actually the costliest war we've ever had. And it was just because our, our uh, population was so much smaller between both Indian and non-Indian peoples. Uh, we had some incursions against uh, Native peoples uh, all the way up to the Revolution. The Revolutionary War was kind of the big one at that time, but it was still contained amongst the East Coast population. Now, we had a, a little bit of spillover to the Appalachians at that time. Uh, but then, from the Revolution, we had the War of 1812. That really wasn't that big in the greater sphere of things. We had the war with Mexico. We still had a very small army at that time. And that army was sent to Mexico. It was, uh, it was fought on foreign shores. It didn't impact the lives of the people here on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was 1847 and 1848. So now here we are by 1862. The, most of the people from the Revolutionary War generation had passed away. Those who were living by 1860 had never really experienced war. Some of your, your military officers did, but as far as the actual common person, war was still a very foreign thing. So by 18, April of 1861, when the shots were fired at Fort Sumter, it wasn't that big of a deal because it was an artillery duel. People in Charleston used to line up on their balconies to watch essentially the fireworks. And I think it was only like one, one, one mortally injured person at Fort Sumter. And, or it was one wounded and one person died when something collapsed on them. It was, it, it was something like that. There was not that much in the way of casualties. Then we had Bull Run. Bull Run was a big thing in the D.C. area, but that didn't impact Ohio. It didn't impact Kentucky. It didn't impact Mississippi or Minnesota, except for very small numbers. Around Manassas Junction, it was a big deal. But then, what happened after Bull Run? We had a small engagement in the Eastern Theater at Ball's Bluff, outside of Leesburg, Virginia. That wasn't that big of a deal as far as the common people. I mean, it was, it's always a big deal for the participants. In the Western Theater, you had the Battle of Belmont. That, again, was a minor skirmish. Then, by February of 1862, uh, and I also forgot, you had the Trail of Blood on Ice in... Uh, in Indian Territory, now known as Oklahoma. You also had the Battle of Pea Ridge. That was, I think, March of 62. But you never really had 40,000 troops clashing against 40,000 troops in a no-holds-bar match. Belmont in Kentucky was nothing. Forts Henry and Donaldson was siege warfare among small numbers of troops. And then we had the big one. And that big one was April 6th and 7th, 1862, along the banks of the Tennessee River at a place known as Pittsburgh Landing. And today, because there was a little uh, church building named Shiloh nearby, that's how the battle got its name. So we're going to take a look right now at the Civil War Trust animated map of the Battle of Shiloh. And this video should put that battle into context and then we'll discuss a, a little bit more further on the other side of the video. Two hundred and fifty Union men of Everett Peabody's brigade 
of Hurley on patrol. For the past three days, their pickets had been exchanging shots with Confederates. Many worry it signaled a pending attack. But no one in high command had been convinced. That Sunday morning, within earshot of their camps, they find a monster lurking amidst the Tennessee timber. 9,000 Confederates spearheading a surprise attack. After the next two days at Shiloh, our nation would come to realize the true bloody cost of civil war. By the spring of 1862, the Union's disaster in the East at Bull Run the previous summer seemed a distant memory thanks to a string of victories in the West. In February, the Army and Navy under Union Brigadier General Ulysses Grant and Flag Officer Andrew Foote had worked together to capture Forts Henry and Donaldson. Combined with the loss at Mill Springs, Kentucky, General Albert Sidney Johnston, the Western Confederate commander, was forced to move southwest, handing over Kentucky and much of Tennessee, including the crucial supply and industrial center of Nashville. Major General Henry Halleck, commanding the Department of Mississippi, ordered federal forces up the Tennessee River, a major conduit into the heart of the Western Confederacy. The Federals embarked in March, using 174 steamboats to ferry almost 40,000 men toward their eventual target, a now bustling junction in northern Mississippi. In this day, rivers and rails are the key means to move men and supplies quickly. And Corinth, Mississippi is a crucial southern rail link. It straddles the Mobile and Ohio Railroad and sat on the only line connecting the Atlantic and the Mississippi. And by mid-March, Grant's army was in position to capture it as they encamped around Pittsburgh Landing. His was a good defensive position. Waterways protected both flanks and their rear, and they were within 20 miles of Corinth. But Halleck, cautious, has ordered Grant to hold until the 30,000 men of Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio arrives from Nashville. On April 2nd, Johnston learns that Buell's approaching column is near Savannah, Tennessee. It is an opportunity to strike his opponents while they are divided, and Johnston seizes it. General P.G.T. Beauregard, the hero of Fort Sumter and Bull Run, plans a very complex attack that attempts to coordinate Johnston's four corps. But rainy weather turns the roads into mush, delaying the attack. Believing surprise is lost, Beauregard urges retreat. Undeterred, Johnston declares, gentlemen, we will attack at daylight. Despite warnings, Union commanders are confident that Johnston's army remains at Corinth. General Grant headquarters across the river at Savannah, and few of the regiments manning what is to become his front lines had ever been in a full-scale battle. Johnston's intent is to turn Grant's left flank away from the lifeline at Pittsburgh Landing. But it's Grant's right that receives the first Confederate attacks as William Hardy's brigades advance on the camps of William Sherman's division. As late as 7 a.m., General Sherman remains unconvinced 
This is a general attack until rebel skirmishes from Claiborne's brigade kill his orderly and shoot him in the hand. Two of Claiborne's six regiments move around the swamp and get caught in a vicious crossfire. The intense fighting here is just south of a church with a Hebrew name that ironically meant place of peace, Shiloh. Despite initial resistance, the Union's lines are soon stretched thin. Benjamin Prentice forms his sixth division, including 12 guns on the Eastern Current Road. His untested ranks wither Gladden's brigade. But around 845, Confederate attacks force Prentice to fall back. Many don't stop until they get to Pittsburgh Landing leaving empty camps, hot meals, and all their belongings. Hungry rebels pause to eat and loot. An hour is lost as commanders, including Johnston, struggle to get these men moving again. Amidst the panic, Union defensive lines are patched together with anyone in shouting distance. And casualties and terrain unravel Confederate command structure. By mid-morning, the battle at Shiloh has become a soldier's fight. <laughs> Alerted by the distant thunder of artillery, Grant departs for Pittsburgh Landing around 7.30. He orders Bull Nelson's division of Buell's army to begin moving down the river, but Nelson is unable to march until early afternoon. Grant also orders Lew Wallace's 7,500-man division to reinforce his lines, but a series of errors and delays turn a two-hour march into seven. Neither will arrive before nightfall. Despite a sprained ankle after arriving at the landing, Grant rides the length of his battle line and rushes men and ammunition to his defenders. But until Wallace and the elements of Buell's army arrive, Grant will fight outnumbered. By 10.30 a.m., the Confederate onslaught starts to overwhelm Grant's right flank. Attacks push Sherman and McLaren back, first to the crossroads of the Purdy and Corinth Roads, and then to Jones Field, a mile and a half from Pittsburgh Landing. Johnston succeeds in bending Grant's line, but in the wrong direction, toward Pittsburgh Landing, where the line can be shorter and stronger. With the Union right flank in retreat, entire Confederate regiments fall out of line to eat and pillage. This lull allows Sherman and McLaren to regroup and launch a ferocious counterattack. By noon, they've rolled over the unprepared looting Confederates. For the next three hours, Sherman and McLaren's determined stand will force Johnston to commit his last reserves and will occupy the entire western two-thirds of the Confederate Army. Confederate brigades on Johnston's right make repeated attempts to dislodge Stephen Hurlbut's division from a blooming peach orchard just south of a pond where the dying crawl for a final drink. By two o'clock, Hurlbut's line begins to give after Johnston personally rallies his brigades to attack in mass. Johnson had an old dueling wound that kept his right leg numb most of the time. He may not have paid much mind to the mini ball that severed his artery. 
By 245, Johnston bleeds to death. He is the highest ranking officer to be killed during the Civil War. In Grant Center, the division of W.H.O. Wallace and the remnants of Prentice's ranks form a half mile front and a thick overgrowth along an old wagon cut. 6,200 men and 25 cannon make the names of the places there. The Sunken Road, the Hornet's Nest, synonymous with bloodshed. Thousands of Grant's men have retreated in panic. Lou Wallace is missing, and Bull Nelson, Buell's lead element, is an hour out of Savannah. Low on options, Grant orders a new line of defense at the landing. Around four, Sherman and McLaren, with depleted ranks and no fresh troops, fall back. Confederates pause their attack to get ammunition to the front lines. Sherman and McLaren reform along the heights of a rugged ravine. By 4 p.m., Hurlbut withdraws, forcing Prentice to refuse his left flank. With Grant's right and left flanks in retreat, sounds of heavy fighting in the center draw Confederate brigades like a magnet. W.H.L. Wallace's outnumbered Federals put up a fierce defense from an overgrown thicket. Their intense fire thickens the air with whizzing metal. Rebels call it the Hornet's Nest. Brigadier General Daniel Ruggles pounds the hornet's nest with almost 60 cannon, the largest concentration of artillery on the North American continent up to that time. By 5 p.m., elements of 14 of the 16 Confederate brigades on the field surround the hornet's nest. Wallace and Prentice start to withdraw. Then Wallace is shot in the head and left for dead. Over 2,000 men are captured. The day-long federal stand waged all across the battlefield at such places as the Peach Orchard, Hornet's Nest, and Crossroads, staves off total defeat and buys Grant another day to fight. Grant's army has fallen back two miles and incurred immense casualties. Heavy cannon fire from the Union timberclads, Tyler and Lexington, pesters the Confederate lines. Grant's last line on April 6th is formidable. Confederates must cross huge ravines at Dill and Tillman Branch. Stall, the Confederates withdraw to the captured Union camps. Little effort is made to supply ammunition or reform their exhausted ranks. That night, a heavy rain moves in, soaking the living and the dead alike. Beauregard, now in command, believes Grant's reinforcements are not coming and sends a dispatch to Richmond proclaiming complete victory. In fact, the lead divisions of Buell's army had a hand in defending Grant's last line, and Lew Wallace's division finally arrives on the scene about dusk. Though these reinforcements had been spotted by rebel Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest, no one in Confederate high command took any action. Handed his greatest setback since the war began, Grant vows to whip him at daylight. By 6 a.m., Grant has 40,000 at the ready. 
half of which are battle fresh. The weary Confederates number around 28,000. Despite their exhaustion and disorganization, when Grant's army moved to retake the field and drive the rebels back, Beauregard eventually manages a solid defense. Despite his savage counterattacks, he is forced back two hours later to a position along the Hamburg Purdy Road. Ultimately, the Union numbers are too great for Beauregard's depleted ranks. At two, he pulls back in retreat to Corinth. Grant does not pursue until the next day. Almost 24,000 men are killed, missing, or maimed in just two days. Shiloh is the bloodiest battle in American history up to that time. Despite winning Shiloh, Grant is vilified for the shocking losses and near defeat. Many demand his removal from command. President Lincoln refuses, saying, I can't spare this man. He fights. In Albert Sidney Johnston, the Confederacy loses a prized leader. No general will fill his void in the Western theater. Beginning in May with Corinth, the Union Army embarks on a Western mission of conquest, with many more places to fall. Vicksburg, Chattanooga, Atlanta. The battlefield is quiet now, though a new fight is ongoing against the foes of time and progress. Nearly 4,000 acres of land have been preserved, most recently the site of the Fallen Timbers action. Once host to two of the bloodiest days in American history, Shiloh is now one of the best preserved battlefields of the Civil War, a sprawling living monument to the sacrifices made there 150 years ago. And I want to thank the Civil War Trust for putting that together. That is a very good depiction, one of the best, uh, most, most comprehensive, but yet easy to understand depictions of the battle that I've ever seen in video form. Now, there were Minnesotans there. First thing I will mention is the role of Brackett's Battalion. Uh, they, there were three companies of cavalrymen. These cavalrymen from Minnesota uh, were the ones, they, they were assigned to the 5th Iowa Cavalry, but they were also in, you know, an independent battalion, which means that they could be taken away from the 5th Iowa at any time and sent on to their own uh, mission. And that's what happened when, uh, after Grant had arrived at Savannah and then needed a telegraph line to connect with Don Carlos Buell's army coming from his Army of the Ohio coming from Nashville. He needed to get the telegraph lines to Buell to tell him to hurry up. And it was the role of Brackett's battalion in uh, making sure that the roads were clear, the bridges were constructed, and that the telegraph lines were put in that allowed Grant to connect to Buell. And Grant was able to say, hey, meet me at Pittsburgh Landing and hurry up, I need you. And that's how they got there. So Minnesotans helped save the day that way. The other is the first Minnesota Light Artillery. And I'm going to read a little bit out of uh, Lieutenant Henry, uh, Henry S. Herter. He wrote in the uh, Minnesota in the Civil and Indian War the following. And it's, I'm going to just give you the short piece because I could spend the whole hour reading what he wrote. Uh, but... The first Minnesota Light Artillery started off under William Sherman, and then they were transferred uh, from Sherman's division over to Prentice's division. And that was on the evening of the 4th of April. Uh, the orders were received transferring to Prentice Division, and um, they were about two miles to the left of, uh, of where they were, so they had to move camp. So on Saturday, which was the 5th, they moved camp, struck our tents in full sight of Prentice headquarters, and alongside the 5th Ohio Battery, which was Hickenloopers. Uh, then being put bent on putting camp in as good a shape as possible for Sunday inspection, we were out and at it bright and early. It must have been soon after 5 o'clock in the morning uh, when we heard the first firing in what was supposed 
what was then supposed was the front. But little attention was paid to it, uh, everyone supposing that the pickets were firing off their guns on being relieved. So it was just a small little skirmish. Now if we can actually bring up map one, uh, right down here, I know it's going to be tough to see, but you have uh, Prentice right here, and then right up here is the camp of the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery, right there. And that's where they were at at that time. So now Colonel Everett Peabody of the 25th Missouri I Infantry, he had put up uh, a 250-man patrol. And that patrol went down here and they engaged Confederates at Fraley's Field. That was actually the first fire, fighting of that morning. And, and I've actually been to Shiloh and it's actually from Fraley's Field to where uh, camp was, it's exactly one mile. And it is rolling hills and ravines. And that it is, it's rough stuff. Now I did spend uh, ten, at least 10 years as a Civil War reenactor. I've been in the wool uniforms. I've marched through that kind of terrain. And so when I go to Civil War battlefields, you know, my reenacting training and mindset opens up along with my historical uh, studies. And I, I would not ever want to walk through that much less have to fight my way through it. So that was this one mile right here. Everett Peabody you know, has really been credited with the person who alerted the Union Army to the Confederate attack. And it was because he thought something was up and he took his um, Missouri and Michigan troops out and uh, uh, went after the Confederates here just to make sure that there was, you know, wondering if there was something going on. And there was. So Peabody was actually killed practically by his own tent. Uh, he was shot uh, five times, I believe it was, and the major he had lead the expedition was shot 11 times. Uh, so they were killed right there in their own camp. Now I'm going to read back from, uh, from um, Herder from the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery. About 7 o'clock we noticed a commotion at the headquarters, the general staff and his staff mounting and riding off in the direction whence the firing came. The 18th Wisconsin, which arrived the day before, fresh from Madison, Wisconsin, and were camped a little to the left in front of us, left their camp and marched in the same direction, while we had orders to be ready to move at a moment's warning. For about 10 or 15 minutes, all was hurry and bustle in camp. Then we stood ready, waiting for the order. Without rations, without baggage of any kind, leaving our knapsacks packed in our tents under charge of the quartermaster sergeant and the wagon master, who, by the way, had six baggage wagons under him, we finally left the camp under orders to proceed to the front, following the four guns of the 5th Ohio. We had not proceeded over three quarters of a mile when the latter pulled out to the, road, to the left of the road and commenced to get into the battery. We formed on the right of the road, but before we had unlimbered, the rebels, whom we saw skulking through the woods, opened on us, and one man fell shot through the neck, while three others were wounded. The two first name uh, subsequently died of their wounds, although it is the writer's opinion that either of the two with proper care would have recovered. Our captain soon proceeded to, cover the, uh, to perceive that the rebels had discovered two batteries firing on them, with not a solitary infantryman to cover them and determined on taking them in, gave the order to limber to the rear and owing to his sound judgment shown in the manner in which we had formed into battery, we retired without leaving any of our guns, although the left piece of the center section had become disabled, the trail breaking in two at the elevation screw. Captain Munch, Emil Munch, he uh, was from uh, Pine County, he was a Prussian, um, Munch's horse received a bullet in his head and fell and attempting to remove his saddle, the captain himself received a ball in his thigh, disabling him for further service on that field. When our battery, retreating past our camp, the writer made a flying visit to it while well, directing a couple of sick comrades who were still in the tents, unaware of the condition of things, what direction to take, the rebel bullets commenced to fly about, indicating that they were closing up pretty fast. When I rejoined the battery, it had taken just a, it had taken a new position on a small elevation with an open field to our left and was awaiting the enemy. Now, if I take a look at map two here, we're going to show... Uh, Right in here, you have Munch, you have two small artillery batteries, which I believe are 
Yeah, Wallace, right in here, there's Munch, and then here's Hickenlooper right underneath. So those were those two. That's the 5th Ohio, that's the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery. Look at the direction that the Confederates were coming in. Now, they had already made their attack on Sherman's force over here. 1st Minnesota Light Artillery would have been engaged in that had they not been transferred, but now here they were. This area we'll talk about in just a little bit was known as the Hornet's Nest. So right now we're going to take a look at a video uh, regarding what it's like today to farm on one of those farm fields that had uh, been fought over back on April 6th, 1862. In 1862, the first major battle of the Civil War took place at Shiloh, Tennessee. This area is now preserved as National Park and Memorial. The battlefield was originally farmland, and to keep the setting historically accurate, the Park Service leases the land in the park to farmers. Park Administrator John Bundy explains. We have cultural landscapes of farmers' fields that are part of the story. That would have been important to the battle, would have directed how part of the battle happened in little particular areas. And these fields are part of that landscape. So when we lease these fields out, we actually are kind of incorporating the farmers into the National Park Service because they can become part of how we tell the story. Brad Hunt of Adamsville, Tennessee, is one of the farmers that leases these lands and tells us about his participation in this unique program. The park was a way um, to, to rent land um, at a very relatively low rate, um, somewhere around $2. We are in the central location of the park now. Um, this is relatively known as the Sarah Bell Field. This was the Sarah Bell Farm during the battle. Um, this is the, the largest track of land on the park inside the interior of the park. Um, this field encompasses about 27 acres. Although peaceful and beautiful today, it is difficult to imagine and important to remember that this was indeed the very ground that was covered with fallen soldiers and the site of a highly emotional event. This was the, some of the heavier action, probably the second heaviest action field uh, during the battle. The heaviest field being, of course, where we call as the hornet's nest, which would be just to the northwest of us here. This would have been in the in infantry line um, of that battle. But the casual rate here would have been probably the second highest open ground field in the battle of the two-day battle here at Shiloh. Hunt takes his role in the park seriously and has grown a variety of crops on these hallowed fields. For years, this field was used in a rotation between haylage and for summer production and wheat um, or some type of forage in the summer and wheat in the winter. Um, the Bermuda stand in this field, we had fought it for years, and in 08 or 09, I began thinking, why fight a crop that can be utilized? And so we started trying to pamper the Bermuda. Um, this is a really good stand of grass. You're looking at production here off of this cutting being in around the four and a quarter rolls to the acre of cured hay that's going to be well over three tons of cured hay per acre on this production. Any farmer or rancher has an attachment to land under their care. For Hunt, farming land that is such an important part of American history carries even greater significance. Tim Blaine, RFD-TV. So now the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery, they had taken their disabled piece from the, you know, their initial position and moved it back to Pittsburgh Landing for repairs. What happened with the remaining five guns? They went to what is now known as the Hornet's Nest. And if we can pull up the next map, the Hornet's Nest is right here and there is a small little, well there's a little road right in here and somewhere in here, right in that area is Emo Munch's 1st Minnesota Light Artillery, right at the apex. The uh, back here is where all of the other artillery is, and then right there on the line is the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery. They were the first artillery unit to actually discharge gun, uh, their artillery pieces on the field at Shiloh, and they were right there in the thick of things, um, you know, in the middle of the battle. Uh, brief thing from Lieutenant uh, Fander, who was with the, um, with the light artillery. The space occupied by the hornet's nest was not very large and could, from the position which I occupied and on horseback, be at times surveyed tolerably well. 
I've always been of the opinion that Welker 6 and R4 pieces were the only artillery there. They actually had five, uh, just a quick correction to the lieutenant. Uh, twice, rebel batteries were placed in the timber at the further edge of the field to dislodge us, but before they were able to get into our range of our position, our guns had silenced them. For hours, they vainly tried to break our line and the left section of the battery under Lieutenant Peebles, having been ordered further to our left, had to repel several determined charges and was badly cut up, but inflicted terrible losses on the enemy by mowing them down with canister at close range. Um, After, well, and if you, if you go back to that uh, video that was shown from the Civil War Trust, the, the animated map, and that area where the Confederates had surrounded that small little bit of the Union, uh, you see that blue surrounded by red, that was where the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery was, in the middle of that blue. The eight Confederate attacks is what they had repulsed, and yet they still managed to make it back to the lines with uh, General Grant. Uh, General Prentice had uh, given a lecture in White Bear Lake uh, in 1888, and he said that the 1st Minnesota Battery had never received the credit it deserved for its gallantry, uh, that it was mainly due to the excellent work done by them, and particularly by particularly by the left section under Lieutenant Peebles, that the hornet's nest with its comparatively small force of men held out so long against the overwhelming numbers of the rebels. That came from General Prentice himself. The casualties of the day were Private Stinson, Taxdall and Tilson killed, Corporals Davis and Lammers died of wounds, Captain Munch, Lieutenant Peebles, Sergeants Clayton and Connor were severely wounded, uh, several more were lightly wounded, both Captain Munch and Lieutenant Fander's uh, horses were killed from under them, and 16 horses of the battery were killed. That was your Minnesota first, first Minnesota Light Artillery at Shiloh, especially the Hornet's Nest. And we're going to take a look right now at a video explaining more about the Hornet's Nest. The Civil War Battle of Shiloh took place April 6th and 7th, 1862, in Hardin County, Tennessee, and resulted in a Union victory over Confederate forces. Nearly 110,000 troops took part in the fighting, which produced almost 24,000 casualties, making it the bloodiest battle to that point in U.S. history. American History TV visited Shiloh National Military Park, where Stacy Allen, the park's chief ranger, gave us a tour of the battlefield. In this portion, he talked about the fighting in a sector of the battlefield known as the Hornet's Nest. We've uh, moved to the center of the Union line, astride the Eastern Corinth Road, into a position that's iconic with Shiloh, uh, known forever after the battle as the Hornet's Nest. It marked the center of the brigades participating in the assaults where the Confederates are attempting to attack the Federals here, and they're doing so in piecemeal fashion, primarily lone brigades making these assaults in succession in some instances over the course of the midday and through the afternoon. They were dead center, pretty much dead center on the, on the battlefield. And the Confederates attack through what they describe as a dense underbrush, a heavy, heavy thicketed zone. They called it an impenetrable thicket of young growth, which is different from the normal vegetation on the battlefield, which was old growth forest. The Confederates are attacking through this thicket. And people say, well, why are they attacking through the thicket? Because it provided cover. It provided some semblance of protection as they tried to maneuver and get uh, into a position to confront the Federals holding uh, the line here. Besides that, if they moved any further to the north, they'd pass through a wide open field, which would bring their line under uh, Infilated fire from Federals and to the south. There's another open field. And the thicket provided cover. It provided some semblance of protection. It is also apparent that these Confederate troops in the thicket rarely ever saw their opponent. The thicket was that dense. They saw the flashes of the muzzle from both the musketry and the artillery. They saw the smoke, but they rarely saw physical form of an enemy force. So 
So we just passed up uh, Eastern Corinth Road from Confederate markers, which note the uh, farthest advance of the organizations attacking the hornet's nest, uh, to the Union front that ran parallel to an old wagon cut. What's amazing is nobody in either army really mentions the existence of this road on April 6, 1862. There's not a letter or a battle report or a diary entry that selects on the fact that there's an old wagon cut here. There's 6,200 federal troops positioned on this wagon cut and not one of them in April 1862 mentions its existence. Now we know it exists but they don't select upon it, and I, that's important because this wagon cut later on becomes an iconic sunken road, and it was nowhere near being sunken. A couple of wagon ruts, six to eight inches deep, maybe a foot deep here as it crossed the top of the ridge, and that's about it in 1862. We know that's about it because in the initial descriptions of it, when they begin to reflect on the fact that, hey, yeah, there was a road there, that's the initial descriptions. And then somebody applied the term partially sunken and the word stuck. And from that point on, it's known as the sunken road. Uh, I refer to it as just a wagon trace. And uh, one of these days, uh, you know, uh, Maybe the term sunken will be dropped from the usage, but it's there. It's a post-battle term, and it's stayed and been applied to the road. What it does do, though, is it delineated the federal position, a position the federals will hold from uh, the earliest troops arriving here will be under Will Wallace's command. Uh, they'll occupy it about 9 o'clock. They'll be joined by Prentice's remnants, which these markers here to our south uh, note. <coughs> Uh, and Prentice goes into position about 10. Now Prentice retreats through Wallace and through Hurl, but he will reorganize his command in the rear of these two divisions. Uh, of these 5,400 men he began the battle with, he gets anywhere from five to 600 of his men rallied. He'll be joined by the 23rd Missouri, 575 souls. So Prentice will come forward with about 1,200 men. And he'll take a position here in the center of the Union position. Wallace's troops on the north to the right, of Prentiss and Hurlbut's troops to the south. And Okay, this is a good map. If you take a look right in the center and you see the word Munch, M-U-N-C-H, that's Emu Munch and the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery. That shows you that they, in fact, were in the center of the hornet's nest. Now take a look to your left and you see all of those artillery pieces with two divisions of uh, is Rugel's battery firing upon the Iowa troops to the left and to Munch's battery. And then you see uh, the two lines of infantry, uh, that they were making the attacks. And then you look below where you see the attack, Stevens, Gibson, Schaefer, Anderson. And where else did they go besides uh, on the right hand side with the 8th Iowa and the 14th Iowa and Hickenlooper's battery. They also attack Munch. So Munch's battery was getting it from both sides, from all sides, right there in the center of the lines. And that was where your Minnesotans were at Shiloh. Continue. There's 6,200 men online, and there's enough troops in reserve to constitute about 3,000 more. So there's a large number of troops on this sector. We know that two-thirds of the Confederate Army at 11 o'clock to noon are engaged against the Union right flank. Uh, there at Water Oaks Pond in the cross, crossroads. And so well, you, you start just factoring out who's not present in that fight. And we know that throughout the course of the uh, late morning and on into the early afternoon, Johnson's getting about a third of his command engaged over at uh, Sarah Bell Farm, the uh, River Road in the Peach Orchard sector. And you start saying, well, then, you know, that's almost the entire Confederate Army. What does that leave here in the center? That leaves piecemeal brigades in the center. And that's the story at the nest, is that the Confederates attacked this position, held in force by the Federals, with a re repetitive series of assaults by individual lone brigades for the most part.
and those brigades are heavily outnumbered. I mean, the largest attack the Confederates throw against this position is no more than about 3,500 souls. Well, there they're outnumbered two to one. And the average attack the Confederates would throw against this position is around 2,000 personnel. So at any point in time, they're clearly outnumbered by their federal opponent, and then they have to negotiate the thicket and then try to attempt to storm and breast the federal fire. And the federal fire coming off this position must have been horrendous because Confederates afterwards would style that fire and the sound of the whizzing mini balls cutting through the forest as the sound of angry hornets, and thus the position. All right, and so that gives you a good uh, brief on the hornet's nest. And we're gonna, I'm gonna cut that one a little bit short because I wanted to get back to what Lieutenant Herder had to say. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so after they had retreated back to Pittsburgh Landing, uh, he said we had, and they, and they went into the, uh, the entrenchments that were created by Grant's uh, chief of staff. We had five guns in position a short distance to the left of where Colonel Webster had formed an immense battery of some 30 or more guns, among them some siege guns. To our left was another battery that had arrived but a day or two before the battle and had not been assigned yet to any command. At the mouth of the sluice stood the two gunboats, Tyler and Lexington, and when the enemy finally made the attempt, he found the reception too hot and gave it up. Now if you go back to that uh, moving map, and they'd shown that the uh, engagement with the um, with the gunboats, no, the, the moving map, which we, the video we played earlier, so, but yeah, that works too, I guess. Um, so right in here, this is where those two gunboats were, and so the first Minnesota Light Artillery had then been moved over into this area here, and this is where they were firing. Um, but then he ends with, Thus ended the first day at Shiloh. Tired, hungry, and somewhat gloomy, we laid our weary bones down to rest that night, and we got more than rest. We received we got more than rest. We received a drenching that no one could ever forget. The writer had found a comfortable sleeping apartment under one of the tarpaulin covered caissons, and when he awoke in the morning, found the water running between his chest and knees, having been obliged to sit in that position in order to give room to another comrade on the opposite side of the bedroom. The battery did not participate on the second day of the battle. Now, I had actually been to Shiloh a couple of times, but in uh, 2003, I had driven there. And this, this, to me, a little eerie because it was either April 4th or April 5th when I had uh, come through. I think it was the 4th. And it was a drenching, torrential downpour of rain that I have never seen. I mean, the raindrops themselves must have been about the size of you know, the silver half dollars. And I'm not kidding. I mean, they were big drops and they were just coming down all over the car. It got to the point where uh, I had to pull over into a hotel room at, in, uh, was it Rogers or Rogersville, uh, Arkansas for the night. The next day I went to Shiloh and there I read at a plaque denoting Grant's headquarters about this torrential downpour that they had faced the night before. And I'm like, man, that was me last night. I was going through that kind of same downpour a little eerie and then to find out the same thing happened the night of April 6th uh, one quick side story from the annals of the US Christian Commission a uh, Christian Commission delegate visited with a soldier on the field that night after dark and before the rain hit and asked if there was anything he could do to comfort that soldier the soldier had uh, turned around and said yes please sing a hymn for me and they sang the hymn when I when I read my title clear now, according to that description, what's really amazing about it is the delegate and the soldier were singing the, the hymn and other soldiers nearby, both Union and Confederate, all began singing the same hymn in the blackness of the night on the battlefield at Shiloh. That, to me, puts shivers up my spine. If I could have, and I've actually been to Shiloh uh, at night, and I can see exactly why he would want that hymn because the skies were clear, you could see the stars, and it'd be, I mean, it, it would be really moving just to hear that song 
sung on that battlefield amongst all the wounded soldiers. But now, of course, that was not the end of the battle. And as the Civil War Trust uh, battle map had shown that Grant swept through the next day, there was a Minnesotan there also, and that would be uh, Captain William Aker. He had started with the 1st Minnesota Infantry and then had received a commission in the 16th U.S. Uh, Infantry, and he was with uh, Buell's Army. And Captain Aker uh, had arrived there at 6 a.m., disembarked, and prepared to participate in the bloody work that day. That morning, Captain Aker was dressed in his full uniform and urged not to do so by, uh, and to put on at least a private's blouse uh, that he might not be a prominent target. And he replied, no, if I'm to die, I will die with my harness on. Scarcely had the regiment formed in the line and in fact, it was while he was bringing his company into position when a Confederate sharpshooter singled him out from among the rest and the discharge from the rifle sent a bullet into Aker's forehead, entering near the place where he was wounded at Bull Run when he was with the 1st Minnesota and it had killed him almost instantly. He was a highly respected citizen of St. Paul and his death did make the front page of the St. Paul Pioneer Press. He was buried on the battlefield near the old Shiloh Church, but then subsequently he was repatriated to Oakland Cemetery in St. Paul. In, um, you know, and then Tom Presnell from Company C of the 1st Minnesota described Aker as possessed of a brilliant intellect, had admirable military carriage, and was so affable in his nature as to captivate all with whom he came in contact. That was Captain William Aker. And in 2012, uh, the Minnesota Civil War Commemoration Task Force, upon which I was a member, had rededicated the grave of Captain William Aker at Oakland Cemetery. And we were just one hill away from Captain Emo Munch's grave. So that was our Shiloh day. Shiloh, as we know, was a very, very uh, vicious blow. It, it was really the wake-up call that this was going to be a bloody war. So we're going to leave you with a little bit of music remembering the 150th anniversary of Shiloh. Shiloh, of course, would be later eclipsed by casualties at Antietam, which is the bloodiest 24-hour period that we've had. And then, of course, Gettysburg, which came even more over three days. Anyhow, thanks for, uh, for, for Dallas Pearson Producer. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Reminding you, we have 263 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.